Hello everyone and welcome to today's research seminar brought to you by the Department of English and Communication at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Today's speaker is Professor Animal Rannan, who is currently a professor and research director at the University of Helsinki. When I invited Professor Moranan, um, I said to her, I really do regard you as applied linguist par excellence. There are very few people that have written foundational texts in multiple subfields. So three that I can mention, metadiscourse, ALF and linear unit grammar. Not only that, she continues her intellectual fecundity continues. And anyone who has read anything recently that she's written on metadiscourse knows that she is still leading our field. For many years, she was editor of Applied Linguistics and she was also the foundational editor of the Journal of English as a Lingua Franca. Her recent books have included Linguistic Diversity on the EMI Campus, Metadiscourse in Digital Communication, and her forthcoming book, An Eagerly Awaited, Reflexively Speaking, Uses of Metadiscourse in English as a Lingua Franca. Her past leadership roles include President of the Finnish Academy of Sciences and Letters and Vice President of the University of Helsinki. It is my absolute honour to hand over the floor to Professor Anna Morana. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, the, my only regret is that I'm not in Hong Kong because I absolutely love it. And I've even visited the Poly, uh, Poly U um, and I like that. I was very impressed by that as well. So uh, today uh, uh, my topic is meta discourse uh, once again. Uh, and this time in spoken interaction. And the question is, is, it an, is there anything special in it? And uh, I'll give you the answer at the end. Okay, so now I'm try just trying to work out, yeah. So basically, meta discourse is largely about this, human language talking about itself. And all these examples, I'm sure would be very, uh, uh, familiar, look very familiar, apart from the spelling, which uh, is low key, low case uh, uh, all the time, because it's it, it comes from uh, spoken data. But I mean, this is not uh, substantially different from what you might expect to see in uh, in written text. Well, give or take regi some register uh, differences. I mean, nobody says yes, but I have to disagree a little bit in, in, in writing. And I think that meta discourse can be defended. I mean, it has been questioned a lot of, uh, uh, by, by some people altogether. Uh, because, um, uh, for example, John Sinclair said that, you know, kind of like language is always language and kind of like you can't be meta in relation to that. But uh, I think that it's more like, um, human cognition, like metacognition, really, that we are talking about. And um, yeah, it has also been said that you can't really have meta discourse because uh, it's, 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 uh, you, you, can, you can talk about language like you can talk about anything else, but then that is meta language and we'll see how they're different. But I mean, like in, metacognition, we can distance ourselves from our ex immediate experiences, identities, attitudes and gut reactions, and we can subject them to conscious reflection and monitoring. So this ability is what we like to think about, uh, uh, like to uh, call um, metacognition, to thinking about our own thinking, making our thinking an object of thought itself. And therefore, similarly, we can be aware of our verbalizations and indicate this by verbalization. And this is what we do with meta discourse. Well, to, uh, then to move on to spoken interaction, um, it's not difficult to argue that this is the fundamental mode of human language, because I don't think that people really disagree about this. Uh, that's less controversial than the existence of meta discourse. Well, humans may not be as unique as they have liked to think, but there are at least two species specific characteristics that uh, repeatedly come up in, in research uh, findings and in researchers' arguments. 
uh, they they will probably dis uh, they will may disappear later, and others may come up. But these at least we have the tendency of humans to collaborate and to communicate more than other species. And I think these are extremely important for us. And this, uh, uh, and it's not very controversial either, that speech is the basic and oldest mode of human language. So, um, to kind of like to find support in earlier research uh, is that some, uh, some researchers speak of the interactional in instinct as the basis of communication and as the driver of language development, notably Tomasello and Lee et al, which means John Schumann with his allies really. And I quite like what Mercier, uh, uh, Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperber uh, uh, say uh, in, in their uh, joint book, uh, where they stress the flexibility of human interaction and they put it very nicely by noting that for humans, uh, knowing what to expect of each other is a crucial cognitive challenge. And it's true, because I mean, th this goes with the flexibility of uh, human interaction, and I would like to argue human language, is that it is extremely flexible. And one of the advantages is that we know we, we can speak about it. I, I'm not sure about animal language. I mean, it always surprises us how complicated, how complex it is and what they can do. But I'm yet to see an evidence that, say, a mallard mother says to mallard um, uh, chicks that you should not have gone in there. I told you before. I mean, like, they just don't usually say these kinds of things. Of course, we don't really know because we don't speak mallard. We don't even speak dog, which is very unfortunate. But um, given that this flexibility also creates uh, more uncertainty in our wonderful uh, ability to communicate, uh, meta discourse is definitely one of the language resources that we have to explicate what we can expect from each other in communication and in interaction. Therefore, the relationship of meta discourse and interaction is really um, complicated and slightly surprising because if this is the case indeed that um, that we actually have um, that that we need at this course to uh, to cope with the contingencies of flexible, complex human communication, and that interaction uh, uh, and interactional speech are the fundamental uh, ways in which human language is realized. Why do they not ever meet in research? Because they don't. Interactional linguistics and conversation analysis are enormous research fields. We know, I mean, there are thousands of researchers in this world and have been for the last several decades who do little else than uh, analyze conversations and interaction mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and language uh, and the role of language in it. Whereas meta discourse research is, a far, is, is far smaller and more specific. So it's not all that surprising that conversation analysis or interactional linguistics do not ever uh, talk about meta discourse, but they talk about some phenomena that relate to it, like projection, which is the term they use largely for prospecting ahead in conversation. And most of them recognize this. It's more surprising that in meta discourse research, <coughs> excuse me, in meta discourse research, interaction usually re uh, refers to writer to reader interaction. In other words, like unidirectional and sometimes speaker to audience interaction, also uni uh, unidirectional. Why? I mean, why should interaction be unidirectional at all? And I think one of the differences really here is underlying differences. I'm not sure if I'm right, but I suspect that it's because interna interactional linguistics is basic research. It's fundamental research. 
Whereas meta discourse has actually its roots deep in EAP practice, and it's taken it very, very seriously. Everything has to be practical, but we can discuss it later, and I'll return to it at the end. Well, it is actually true that only minor differences have been found between spoken and written meta discourse, which is unfortunate. Early comparisons found practically none at all. More recent studies have found slightly more, but usually go like in some sub sub category, but no, uh, uh, no radical departures either. Well, most of this research has compared spoken and written academic monologues. I mean, if you have like academic monologues, they are arguably very similar genres. And all the research has applied the same framework on birth modes, which is again, slightly problematic because I mean, how can you uh, get away from it if you apply that in the first place? But whether a broad and or thin approach or a narrow or a thick one um, in meta discourse uh, studies, the results remains the same. So why about that? If we already know that they are the same. What happens is that if we change the data and methods, we get a slightly a different picture. And what uh, and what happened last uh, last spring is that Man Zhang came up with a, a multi-dimensional corpus analysis of meta discourse across registers. It's the first one I know of. <clears throat> it's a very kind of like Biber type of, um, of, of, of analysis, but focus on meta discourse. Um, he included dialogic and conversational registers. So he found, a, found significant, dif significant differences between dialogic and monologic registers. I thought it was really interesting because Mark, oh, Marquez, of course, it's a cop study he used, uh, looks, uh, 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 tries to discover. Marquez of participant interaction, he found, were, were frequent in dialogues, but not in monologues. There were other differences, but these are the most most important ones. Um, so one might think that the cross-modal cross similarity that was found in previous studies may be, sorry, um, uh, may be explained by characteristics of monologues. So it's really interesting. And of course, uh, since I read this last, uh, I assembled upon this last spring, I um, uh, quickly wrote a book about it and you will now hear about my findings on the field. Well, not quite. The book was practically there. I was just revising it. So, so but it was, a, it was good news. It was really interesting. So as far as I know, and I may be wrong, Studies of meta discourse in dialogues, although there aren't very many, um, only one of, um, uh, uh, is, is of unspoken uh, meta discourse, have met, not made comparisons to monologues. So we don't really know what the differences might be uh, from meta discourse, uh, non corpus multi dimensional meta discourse studies. Okay, so some preliminary. Uh, assumptions and points of departure. My main focus here is on spoken dialogues, in other words, and therefore co-present social interaction. Important concepts are prospection and prediction. And the difference I make, I mean, the first one, prospection, is I think originates with John Sinclair, who talked a lot about prospection in text and prediction in cognitive um, science and brain science. And the way I'm using them is that the speaker uses reflexive discourse or reflexive meta discourse to prospect, to update and to change the ongoing discourse. Then 
dissipate the discourse ahead and interpret and confirm its import um, to the point of the utterance, up to the point of utterance. The listener in turn actively predicts what is likely to come up in the discourse and they can't help it because it's, it's their, their brain does it all the time. So, I mean, brain science these days postulates an active brain which is very different uh, from previous uh, depictions and conceptualizations of the brain. So um, in this way, they complement each other. They play interdependent roles as they alternate in speaker and hero roles. And of course, this happens very fast in uh, actual interaction. It's different in monologue. So already we have the, so the fundamental settings are different in dialogues and monologues. So my approach to meta discourse is what is known as reflexive, um, and it has a reason, but I'm not telling you now. So it can also be called reflexive meta discourse. I think this is Anneli Edel's term, which is convenient, or discourse reflexivity, which I have used before. And it's a, it, it, can, it is understood here as discourse about the ongoing discourse. So nothing outside the, dis, the present discourse, although kind of like in seminar series, conf, in a conference events, etc., you can talk about the macro events and count them into ongoing discourse. My data comes from dialogues from conferences, graduate seminars, and thesis de defenses, as well as written dialogues from uh, discussion threads from research blogs. And the monologues come from conference and graduate seminar presentations. And my corpora are of academic English as a lingua franca, alpha, which is spoken, and relfa, which is written and has incorporates the the uh, the discussion threads. All right. So, what do we find in reflexive meta discourse in spoken dialogues? Let's go through the main types first. Reflexive meta discourse contextualizes uh, speech and negotiates its course in spoken interaction. And some of it, the way I see it, manages the discourse itself. Uh, sorry, now I'm saying situation management. This is discourse management, while other kinds of instances primarily manage the interaction, which is situation management. Okay, so discourse management and situation management. So if we talk about managing discourse, we have two kinds. One is principal kinds. Uh, one is orienting. The other word, in other words, the speaker prospects what follows. For example, by looking ahead. Let me continue a little bit more. Or indicating how they may mean their upcoming speech to be taken. Just a comment. Or not to be taken. Or not to be taken. This is not criticism. Whereas retrieving, uh, as separate from orienting, refers to a past state of the discourse. This is more problematic than the more obvious uh, orienting type. Because in a way, it picks an element from a past state of, discourse, of the discourse. In other words, really, the speaker's representation of it, which paraphrases or transforms what has passed since obviously it is no longer available in unprocessed form, not to the speaker, not to the, uh, not to the hearer. Therefore, it is a, rep a representation and um, not a direct, because we can't go back in spoken language. Okay, so, and all I said at the beginning was that I would address the last thing, yeah. It can refer, refer back uh, to earlier speech in either the retrieving uh, type uh, or any type anyway, in egocentric reference, along with certain, uh, uh, that is my own reflection on the point. 
okay so this is what you're doing you, you're talking about yourself uh, you make an egocentric self-centric reference or you can talk about an interlocutor's earlier speech in autocentric reference but uh, but the question you used about is there urban history at all so retrieving references contextualize utterances just like the um, um, uh, uh, orienting one but unlike orienting references they look both ways they bring up something from the past and also prospect ahead because most of the time when you make a retrieving reference what you find is and what you expect is in fact a rephrasing of what the person had said before if they say as i said what you expect is what they think they have said which is usually for because they did not say anything like that and i know it by having looked at this uh, transcripts but it's a paraphrase or a representation of what they think they have said. And in actual dialogues, they, all, they often uh, come together so that uh, I'd just like to make a brief comment, which is orienting uh, on this. The last speaker who uh, in parentheses mentioned, which is retrieving. So both are very natural uh, parts of ongoing uh, int uh, spoken interaction. So main kinds of uh, uh, reflexive, also a uh, reflexive spoken di dialogue also kind of like includes ma managing the situation, and I think managing situation is something that um, is not often talked about because there's so little of it. I mean, it's, it's so trivial in monologues, but if you get discussions, they need managing. Even casual conversations, there are ways of opening and closing conversations for people to join in or leave the conversation to move to a new phase. Uh, uh, and in general, uh, perform acts that ensure the smooth progression of talk. Academic discussions can allocate this to chairpersons, as we know. Questions, comments, arguments, please. Professor Sersa. But there is more to it. When people, there are also other people, other participants can come in. So when they ex adopt an external perspective on, of the discussion, instead of in engaging with the issues. So the kind of like managing the discourse relates to the outer shell of the discussion, as it were, or the disc discourse, whereas managing uh, the, uh, sorry, managing the situation, managing the interaction uh, attends to the outer, uh, outer shell of the, uh, of the discourse, whereas uh, managing the discourse is, deals with, it, uh, with the issues themselves and how the discourse proceeds. So people can, for example, comment on it. It was a very nice discussion. I really enjoyed it. Or they can challenge the way the discussion is going. And this seems to be the interesting bit. Oh, it's, a, it's one of those general questions we can talk over and over again. I kind of like, so people actually uh, take the management, uh, management roles from the chairpersons and in this sense, plane shift can be a power game in discussions. So basically, if we look at what I'm said, said so far, and this is the basic, perhaps my um, feeble drawing of the um, of discourse reflexivity in spoken disc uh, dialogue, um, up where I say discourse reflexivity, I did not think it would be a cue, discuse reflex, uh, 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 reflexivity, but it's 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 just a, uh, an unfortunate uh, extra stroke with the pen. So we have managing discourse and managing situation, contextualization, uh, contextualizing which um, uh, in, in, within managing discourse, which consists of orienting and retrieving and which again uh, 
consists in egocentric and autocentric. And with managing situation, we basically have chair and other. And that's enough for the, for the moment. There is one important thing, negotiating, which I will come back to very soon. If we now make some comparisons, we can first of all compare the medium, spoken and digital, in other words, written dialogue. What we find in both is that retrieving references are far more common than orienting. If we look at the red figure, so it's around 40%, it's about 40-60 uh, in both cases, around 40% of orienting and 60 for retrieving. So in essence, spoken and digital dialogues are, are alike, which I think is interesting. And moreover, if we look at uh, uh, more, more closely into the uh, references, uh, the uh, uh, references, especially the retrieving references, it's autocentric references that are more common than egocentric. And this is about 70 to 30. And it's pretty much the same relationship in both of these uh, discourse types or event types. So the only difference actually lies in who is being addressed in autocentric references, because in speech we tend to talk to the second person to some uh, who are we talking to whereas in the digital most mode it's it's highly impersonal it's it, it's post it's a posting and this is a channel effect there are reasons for it why you talk about postings and not people first of all everybody uses uh, uses um pseudonyms and secondly it's asynchronous you're not really there at the same time Whereas if we move on and make comparisons between, uh, of mode, dialogues versus monologues. So the overall comparisons show, first of all, that monologues, unlike dialogues, predominantly oriented, orient and dialogues retrieve. Okay. And this is a huge difference. In uh, dialogues, it's already, we already noted it's around 40 60, but in monologues, it's the other way around. 70% is uh, orienting and only 30 retrieving. Moreover, who they refer to is predominantly themselves. Dialogues uh, refer to others. So in monologue, the references are egocentric, predominantly. The, the most common uh, phrase, in fact, in, in monologues uh, is, as I said, so they're talking about what they've said, whereas um, uh, dialogues say, as, as you were saying, as you said, Okay, so but there are two categories um, that I distinguished only in one of the modes. One in, uh, is in uh, monologues, and it is uh, commenting, or I call it commenting, and one is in dialogues, negotiating. Commenting consists of First of all, clarifications, what I mean with this scientific interest. And evaluation, it has been fairly successful, I would say, or focus. I need to stress that the issue of equality, etc. All right, so if we look at what negotiating consists of. First of all, matching perspectives, which has two types, clarifying and negotiating viewpoints. And secondly, gener generating knowledge. Matching perspectives, if we go 
start from that, is a minimal outcome of intellectual collaboration. I mean, I think it's important to note that humans not only are keen to collaborate, but a lot of the time when we think of human collaborations, we use examples like uh, lifting a table or um, hunting together or something like that. Anyway, something that is like not speaking. But I think that intellectual collaboration is equally important. And in academic contexts, that is, of course, the primary thing. Or should be, supposedly. But matching speaker perspective is something that helps interactants to find themselves on the same page, as it were. In other words, uh, in psycholinguistic terms, we could talk about them uh, 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 trying to seeking to align their situation models. Speakers negotiate interpretations to find out enough common ground for joint elaboration of a topic or point. So this is largely what you seek to do, uh, to, to, to be able to kind of like, to do something together. You first have to negotiate what it, what it is, uh, what, what your kind of like views are, what your representations are, what your situation models are of something. All right, so we go to clarifying then. It's interesting because it appears in both dialogues and monologues. We just saw it as something that we do in, um, in monologues. Now, they seem to surface when speakers or hearers show concerned, uh, concern about shared understanding. So how do they differ then? Why, how are dialogues different from what we saw in monologues? Okay, now I've got something funny going on here, but okay, these things are happening with PowerPoint. All right, so what happens, and this is an example from a dialogue. I know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I don't understand the first um, the line, but it doesn't matter. I don't think anybody can. But here we come to the uh, clarification. And that's what you call content. content. That's what I call content. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Now get your question kind of thing. So a speaker delivering a monologue fa falls back on their own sense of what in their talk might require their special uh, might require special clarity or precision. In other words, their own theory of mind. While in dialogue participants collaborate towards clarification and seek, seek to align their representations of the evolving discourse, and this is a major difference. So intersubjectivity, which is what we seek, obviously, in, uh, in, 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 in spoken interaction, is sought by a solitary effort in monologue well, and in joint distributed effort in dialogue. Now we look at negotiating, which was missing uh, from monologues, because of course you don't negotiate when you are the sole speaker, the floor is yours. Well, viewpoint negotiations uh, typically contrast with the uh, characteristically neutral or positive tone of clarifications, in that they are, surprise, surprise, critical and debated. Participants weigh up, evaluate, question, and suggest alternatives to each other's arguments, evidence, methods, or premises. In ordinary conversations, they might be slightly different, the topics that they cover, but I mean, in academic discussions, this is very typical. So, my example is quite long, it goes on to, uh, for, for two slides, because you can't have short negotiations, it takes a while. But this is from a uh, graduate seminar, and speaker six has just claimed that capitalism is very much like Protestantism. Protestantism. And speaker one, who is the seminar leader, uh, kind of like dismisses the argument. Oh, it's, it's, orig uh, its origin is in northern Italy from the time when there wasn't any Protestantism, which in a way is true. Um, but a six doesn't give up. You may say it's a religion, but I would say, etc. And it, 
speaker for themselves. You mean that the cultural, uh, cultural circle is something, something? And then they go on a bit. Well, now you're just looking at it like culture and religion. Uh, then they come like, um, you don't know how, how I look at things. And they go on, but religion is, in, is inherited in culture. I've omitted quite a lot because they say a lot more that is irrelevant here. May I point out, uh, may I point that uh, I made a little sociology study uh, in uh, uh, about religion just a week ago. This one, who's not a nice seminar leader, I don't think, says that has it been uh, uh, kind of like comes in with, has it been published in any good international journal? And this is a graduate student, and they all laugh. S7, nevertheless, unfazed. Yeah, many sociologists argue, actually, which is, and et cetera, et cetera, which is kind of support to what he said. Um, it's clear from the context that he means it, speaker six, the, uh, the fellow student. And then the um, patronizing uh, the, the, the guy who leads the seminar, speaker one, says that, yeah, but when we talk about religion, then the problem is, and they go on. But you can see what negotiation is like. It's not necessarily just agreement and happy, um, happily trying to uh, converge on anything. It is actually talking about uh, different things. But the other big thing uh, that we don't find in monologues is generating new knowledge. And I argue that this is something that we do in dialogue. Well, it's very difficult to find evidence of this, but yeah, meta discourse is one type of evidence that we find of this. And this is an example of it. Actually, when I was uh, when you asked how can you measure knowledge, then I kind of realized something. Of course, you cannot measure it. Okay, and this is the main, this is the big thing. Of course, you cannot really measure it. So, meta discourse is a useful indicator of co-construction of knowledge in academic discussions. Beyond doubt. Only a fraction of the, sorry, again a typo, she ideas, the ideas participants spark off in each other can be captured by any analysis. But linguistic indicators are good evidence that this is actually that something that's going on and it's going on on the spot. And we, we can never uh, hope to measure all the ideas that silent participants uh, uh, get from other peop uh, people's uh, speech. I mean, whether they uh, are kind of like uh, silent, uh, uh, silent participants just don't, don't uh, own up what they have got from others. It may also take a longer time when, before you realize that this is an idea you got from somebody else. But we do have these few linguistic indicators in meta discourse that show that yes, this is what is actually going on, even online, on, on the spot, in real time. Then if we look at the incidence of uh, meta discourse, in, uh, in other words, the prevalence, how often it, it, uh, uh, um, it, it takes place. I think this is one of these interesting things, why, why it's kind of like worth counting uh, meta discourse uh, cases um, in a particular piece of data, although it's a bit laborious um, if you don't just look for predetermined markers, um, because you can compare event types. So we had these uh, dialogues, we had monologues, we had different kinds of dialogues and different kinds of monologues. And what surprised me slightly was that, in fact, I mean, the, the uh, average figure of per thousand words is about five expressions of meta discourse. They can be of any length. Some, some of them are short, and some of them are quite long, but individual expressions. And this is the kind of thing that you usually count in um, the uh, kind of like more corpus-oriented 
but uh, small corpus oriented uh, re meta discourse research. So um, this is pretty com comparable, only because different models have been used uh, to um, uh, to make these counts. Uh, they are, it, they are not very comparable because I mean, like for example, the broad approach to meta discourse takes in all sorts of um, things like hedges and uh, boosters and what have you that I don't count into meta discourse at all. So what we have uh, is the incidence. Uh, the general in average incidence is, is five per, per thousand words, but it varies from two cases uh, per thousand words to 12, which is quite a range. So I looked for some factors. I mean, I can't go through all my findings or all my categories or my, anything like that, but I can. Uh, I, I also tried to find out what might be behind might be behind the uh, variation in incidence and i just conjured up a few um, possible um, possible factors that could be there determinants and because i did not i mean this must be taken back with a pinch of salt because i did not originally compile the data to do these things in particular. They just emerged out of the data. These can be challenged and uh, and, and and this is not uh, by any means serious. Uh, kind of like uh, these are not a final word, serious final words on any of these. But I looked at um, some that were discourse related, for example, those differentiated dialogue from monologue. Um, uh, then external ones out of which the duration of discussion actually surprised me most because it no, it turned out that the more uh, time you give to a discussion, the more it tends to not only develop into new uh, directions, but also, or maybe because of that, uh, it has more. Um, it uses more meta discourse, uh, meta discourse than shorter discussions. I think this was really interesting because um, uh, there's more to it than the length. I mean, and this is proportionally so. I mean, this is like if you have a long discussion, its uh, general incidence is is higher than that in a short discussion, which is actually the lowest spot. Uh, that is uh, the short uh, five minute conference discussion. Uh, slot is usually um, the two, uh, the on, on average, uh, the, the two uh, two cases per, 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 per thousand words. And then I looked at social uh, factors, uh, for example, asymmetries in sh social power, um, power relations. And I picked here as an illustration for uh, just a couple of short comments the social factors because i was so impressed by the kind of like uh, the social uh, uh, power structure analysis that my colleagues um, in hong kong um, uh, jamie mckeon and uh, hans uh, hans uh, ladgot did uh, on um, on kind of like moderator uh, led this uh, 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 discussions i thought that was really interesting so some differences among event types can indeed be related tentatively to their social composition. It's interesting to note that conference participants make older centric references three times more often than participates than participants in graduate seminars. I think this is a lot, three times more. It clearly means something. In conference discussions, then, questions are typically framed with explicit reference to what an addressee has said. So perhaps this is an issue, a question of secondary socialization, uh, socialization into academia, because obviously most graduate students just want to get their degree and never dream of, and never think of, kind of like 
becoming academics. So this is probably something that is like being academic, being an academic. Moreover, um, there is an equality issue of uh, social asymmetry. You'd think, for good reason, that both conf in, in, at conferences and graduate seminars, most participants are just socially at the same level. They're, they're equal. I mean, there are no big hierar hierarchies. But there is nevertheless a source of asymmetry in graduate seminars, because there is this novice expert relationship between students and seminar leaders. Moreover, it's not only that there's a novice expert difference, they may dis might dis disregard it, as they actually do to, an, uh, to some extent in, in thesis defenses, it seems. But in both cases, the uh, the asymmetry, the lack of symmetry, is uh, enhanced by the fact that one of them, one of the participants, evaluates the other's performance, assesses them, and has an upper hand on their potential careers, whether they get their degrees. So this asymmetry. Uh, uh, which are called high vertical distance, manifests differently in managing discourse and in managing situation, which I think is interesting. Because for discourse managing reflexivity, asymmetric status contributes to um, a, larger, a, a large amount, uh, an increase in overall amount. So seminars and doctoral defenses have a lot of it. And but in both of them, the participants are being, or oh, some, or the candidates are being assessed by somebody. So they have a lot of it. So they need to kind of like sort out their relations, their, their relationships, their, uh, what they mean by their discourse and how they relate to each other's comments. Whereas for situation management, vertigo. Uh, asymmetry concentrates management in the hands of higher status participants. And this I, could, I detected in graduate seminars, where the chairs or the leaders account for 90% of situation management, whereas conference chairpersons account for less than 60% of, uh, of, uh, of situation management. In other words, conference chairpersons who are equals with the other participants uh, get challenged quite a lot. Other participants come in and say that, no, this is what we ought to talk about or something like that, you know. Uh, and uh, whereas in, um, uh, in uh, graduate seminars, this practically never happens. Main shifts are therefore typical of more egalitarian discussions which I think is interesting. And that's why I call it a power game, power game. All right, to start winding up. Yes, the answer to my initial question or the question in my title is anything special, dialogic metadiscourse is indeed special. The mode of speaking showed striking contrasts in the uses of metadiscourse. Um, the current results are supported by the findings from uh, uh, from from the Zhang's uh, register-based metadiscourse analysis, which singled out the conversational register. And my results, I think, offer a close-up view of what is going on. Um, why I'm arrogantly saying that uh, that my, uh, my my results are supported by uh, by Zhang's rather than the other way around is that. My results actually predate Zhang's results, and they're quite independent. But it's kind of like interesting to see that uh, different approaches and different studies come up with similar things. Dialogue is synchronous, dynamic, joint activity, which can be symmetric uh, um, in the sense that participants can perform similar actions to each other. Monologic speaking 
uh, is asynchronous, it's performed by a single speaker, and it's therefore neither joint nor symmetric. And so there is a, a clear difference um, in monologues and dialogues, but the, the mode effect is not significant or is not important. I did not do statistical significant testing uh, among dialogues. So written and spoken dialogues are in most respects very similar. The same categorization seems to fit without difficulty, and the distributions within the categories are generally alike. And I must conclude that the results support earlier comparisons of spoken and written monologues. I get exactly the same result. So it's not a speciality of their data. It's not the speciality of their um, of, of monologues either. If the dialogue, dialogic mode is so different from monologues, <coughs> then perhaps meta-discourse research should grow out of its EAP confines, which usually teaches written monologues and spoken monologues, and move on to be a research field which seeks to understand its object beyond descriptions for immediate applied purposes. Thank you.